I think we're we're ready to start. Thank you. This hearing will now come to order. The uh, chair will recognize himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Research and Science Education Subcommittee hearing on science and education at the Smithsonian Institution. When most Americans think of the Smithsonian, they think about the famous museums and the castle along the National Mall. Some that know a little more might also think of the National Zoo. But most people do not know that the Smithsonian Institution receives nearly $800 million a year in federal appropriations, or that over $200 million of that goes toward basic scientific research and dedicated Smithsonian research facilities. In spite of receiving almost a billion dollars a year in taxpayer funds, the Smithsonian is not actually part of any branch of government. Although it began at, with a bequest from British scientist James Smithson, it is technically a federal trust instrumentality established by an act of Congress in 1846. As such, it is appropriate and necessary for the Congress to take a more active role in oversight of the institution's activities and long-term plans. This hearing will focus on the Smithsonian's contributions to scientific research and education, on its vast scientific collections, and how the institution collaborates with federal agencies. I'm looking forward to learning what goes on behind the scenes at their 19 museums and nine research centers, and how they share expertise with 168 affiliated museums from around the country. I'm particularly interested in hearing from the Smithsonian's first ever director of education and about her plans for improving education, outreach, and access programs. Informal science education has been a passion of mine on this subcommittee, probably because I know how my early experiences at the Museum of Science and Industry, Field Museum, and other museums in, in Chicago uh, really influenced my interest in science and engineering. I hope both Director Brown and Secretary Clough will explain how the new position fits into the Smithsonian's strategy and the strategic plan and what its role is and what it should be in federal STEM education programs. The Smithsonian Institution's research centers stretch from the Tropical Research Institute in Panama to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. These facilities which are home to some of the world's foremost scientific experts, are almost unknown to the general public. The Center for Astrophysics, for example, has 300 scientists and 12 telescopes on land and in the sky. But most of us have never heard of the center or its work. The Smithsonian is especially active in the life sciences, including ecology, with four of the research centers and a national zoo focusing in these areas. As one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Zoo and Aquarium Caucus, I'm particularly interested in learning about the zoo's efforts to repopulate endangered species. Finally, I'd like to hear how the Smithsonian works with other federal agen agencies, including through coordinating bodies like the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the National Science and Technology Council. Although federal coordination is a bit more complicated because the Smithsonian is not a part of the executive branch, Working with other science and education agencies is extremely important if we want to maximize the impact of federal spending. One area where it is especially important to coordinate between agencies is in managing and sharing scientific collections. The Smithsonian has one of the largest collections in the world, including over 137 million individual specimens and artifacts used for scientific research and museum displays. In 2005, the Smithsonian and the Department of Agriculture co-chaired in an interagency working group that released a report highlighting the importance of improving collections management. I'm looking forward to learning more about the Smithsonian's plans for implementing the recommendations in this report. I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for joining us, and I look forward to their testimony. And with that, the chair will now recognize Dr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry I held things up, but unfortunately the Education Committee was holding votes, and 
as you know, votes come, um, come before statements. Uh, thank you, Chairman Olinsky. I'm pleased the committee is holding this important hearing today. Smithsonian is, is uh, one of my favorite enterprises. I was involved in it in a couple of different roles. One is on this committee and subcommittee, but also uh, in the old days when I chaired the House Administration Committee, we had to worry about animals dying in the zoo and various things like that. So I have uh, somewhat of a history of the Smithsonian, and I think it's an absolutely marvelous institution. I'm also pleased that have House, as a director of the House Administration Committee, we were able to clear up some of the problems that had developed over the years, and uh, we now have a superb leader hiding behind a pseudo beard, but uh, he's someone I've known for a number of years from his years at Georgia Tech as well. I, uh, I'm just delighted that he was uh, accepted the position of the Smithsonian, and we're looking to to uh, great things from all of you. The main thing the Smithsonian needs is money. And that's true, of course, of every government agency, but it's unique with the Smithsonian because it's not quite a government agency. It's an entity unto itself, and we should do whatever we can to help them in their fundraising efforts. The, uh, and I, I sincerely hope that we are able to develop excellent fundraising methods the Smithsonian has so much to offer this nation, and I, frankly, if I had my way, I'd like to provide a two-way fare for every citizen to come here and spend a few days in the Smithsonian. I don't think I could get that to pass, however. The uh, Smithsonian has a unique role in science and education. Well, uh, I would, did my best to learn everything I could about the Smithsonian's various research entities and especially its work to improve STEM education. A number of years ago, I took a trip with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee to Central and South America. Uh, we were worried about uh, security on ship, ship uh, shipments into the United States, and Panama, of course, is a major center of commerce, so we spent some time there. While I was there, I saw assigned for the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution and decided to stop by. Uh, you can imagine this, this, the pleasure and dismay of the workers at the institution to suddenly have two congressmen appear in the door and ask if we could look around. Uh, the, uh, they did a great job of explaining the function of the Tropical Research Institution and I was very impressed with the work they do. I would have loved to spend a few more days there. And unfortunately, we were on the transportation airplane <laughs> rather than the Smithsonian airplane. I don't think you even have one, do you? Uh, but uh, at any rate, it was a very worthwhile trip. The staff there was extremely gracious in explaining their work and sharing their excitement for discovery. I believe the Smithsonian has resources and insights unlike any other organization. It has subject matter experts who are also committed to public service. Hearing from the world's largest museum and research complex seems wise as we determine how to manage our diverse federal efforts in science, education, and research. I look forward to hearing about this topic from our witnesses today. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers, and I was on a uh, different transportation committee trip down in Panama, and I didn't even have enough time other than for them to point out to the window and say there, there's the Smithsonian building over there. I didn't get a chance to, uh, uh, to scare the uh, people there by, by, by slipping in for, for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point, and at this time, I want to uh, introduce our witnesses. Uh, we have Dr. Wayne Clough, who is the Secretary and CEO of the Smithsonian Institution, and I'm very happy that he's also a civil engineer, uh, former president of uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Ms. Claudine Brown is the Director of Education at the Smithsonian Institution. Dr. Biff Birmingham is the Director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, and Ms. Sherry Werb 
is the Assistant Director of Education at the National Museum of Natural History. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. Uh, when, when you get, uh, if you do pass five minutes, I will start giving you a, a signal with the, uh, the easy end of the uh, gavel, and if you get past six, then you'll hear the other end of the gavel, just to let you know that, uh, uh, give you a little, little warning there. Uh, we are, hopefully we'll have enough time. We're gonna have votes again coming up, another series of votes coming up, so hopefully we'll have time to go through your testimony and, and questions before that. But uh, when you have all then completed your testimony, we'll have the, the questions and each member will have five minutes to ask a question of, of the panel. And so we will start now with uh, Dr. Clough. Dr. Clough, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lipinski and uh, Dr. Ehlers and members of the committee for having us uh, here and giving us this opportunity. Before I read my per uh, statement, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of the objects that I have here on the table. On the far ends of the table are objects that have been collected from the Gulf and near the site of the Deep Horizon oil spill and problem. They represent the so-called voucher collections for the Gulf. The Smithsonian maintains these for the, for the country and they represent the baseline of the ecosystem that, uh, for the entire Gulf and the Atlantic side so that when time comes to establish the damage that has been done and the ability to clean up the damage, you will have to use these voucher collections. Just illustrates the value of collections and having them and maintaining the importance of them. In front of me here on pins are a group of mosquitoes, different types, some malaria bearing, others not so. Uh, we maintain collections of insects, entomological collections that are very useful, particularly for our military. And they venture into some of these dangerous areas to determine the types of insects that might be uh, the types of things that will create problems for our military. These collections are used in concert with other agencies uh, to make those kinds of evaluations. And finally, in front of me in this small orb, uh, is an object from Mars, a little piece of Mars. This is called a Mars meteorite, and it occurred as a result of a meteorite impact on Mars that freed up a piece of Mars, came through the Martian atmosphere, and ended up on Earth. It's estimated that this object is four billion years old, so essentially the age of our Earth, and it is from Mars based on the chemical analysis that's been done of it. The Smithsonian keeps the meteorite collection, the national meteorite collection for our country. Uh, and it is an interesting one. We invite you to come see those at some time uh, when you have the opportunity. So just a little bit about myself. My career has focused on education and research, which much of this related to science and engineering. First as a university faculty member and subsequently to be fortunate to be named president of my alma mater, Georgia Tech. It's now a great honor for me to serve as secretary of the Smithsonian with wonderful colleagues that you'll hear from later and the passionate people who work there. When I started at the Smithsonian, I felt we needed to re-energize our efforts in science and education so that we'd have a much greater effect on what we did for our country. I am excited about the future of the Smithsonian. We have a new strategic plan and a commitment to create new approaches using our existing resources to work across disciplines to attack big problems that our country faces. We are going to do that by building partnerships, not by ourselves, but building partnerships with universities, NGOs, and federal agencies so we can leverage what we and they do rather than creating duplication. As to education, the Smithsonian has always been an educational institution, so we will honor and enhance the traditional visits to our museums while digitally we'll also reach people where they live and learn. This will be a new aspect for the Smithsonian. In doing so, we believe we can help revitalize K-12 education in our nation. We just hired our new director of education, Claudine Brown, to coordinate and to enhance our efforts. And you'll hear from Sherry Werb, who, speak, who works on the front line of delivering education at our Museum of Natural History. Smithsonian science has a storied history that goes back to the founding of the institution in 1846. As the reach of our sciences grew over time, it became geographically distributed as those activities tended to move away from them all since they didn't have to be here. For example, we have a conservation biology institute for the National Zoo that deals with endangered species that's located in Front Royal, Virginia. The Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is located in Edgewater, Maryland. 
3,000 acres on the Chesapeake Bay, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. These units, combined with the Mall based Natural History Museum and Great Air and Space Museum, comprise a remarkable and uniquely positioned national science enterprise. Of course, it really all comes down to people. And I've learned much by personally going to meet our scientists in their laboratories as well as their field sites in places like Chile, Kenya, Panama, Antarctica, and the far reaches of Alaska most recently. I can assure you our scientists are passionate about what they do, they are committed public servants, and they are enormously talented. Well, the Smithsonian science is really a diverse enterprise, and I want to take just a moment to attempt to define our role and the uniqueness of it. First, who are we? Today, more than 500 Smithsonian staff scientists work in fields such as astronomy, biology, botany, zoology, entomology, paleontology, and earth sciences. The quality of their work is demonstrated, if you look over the last decade, by hundreds of publications in the most prestigious science publications like Nature and Science Magazine. Among our research staff, 17 are members of the National Academies, and we have one Nobel laureate. The Smithsonian is exceptional and distinctive in conducting long-term studies that require large data, data gathering exercises, something that's critical in understanding deep processes, and you see some of that evidence here on the table. We have the largest and most used natural history collection on Earth. 126 million of those 137 million objects are natural history collections. They are used by almost all the federal agencies for their work. We have an ambitious idea to create a digital Smithsonian to deliver what we do here on the Mall out to people where they work and they live. What do we do now? We believe we examine some of the most complex and time-sensitive problems that our nation faces. Our scientists assess the consequences of climate change. We keep aircraft safe from bird strikes. We document and control invasive species and assist our armed forces in keeping them safe from insect-borne disease. What are we going to do differently in the future? Our strategic plan lays that out. We shape the future by preserving our heritage, discovering new knowledge, and sharing our resources with the world. We have a series of grand challenges, and two of these deal specifically with our science mission. First, understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet, which is critical to the survival of our species. We have unmatched capacity to tackle this task. As an example, the Smithsonian Institution Global Earth Observatory's network observes trees, millions of trees and forests around the world. You'll hear more of that from Biff Birmingham. And second, unlocking the mysteries of the universe, particularly based in our work at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, one of the world's great physical observatories. Thanks to the help of Congress and the American people, the Smithsonian will continue to strive to enhance our relevance to the nation by improving scientific literacy providing information that's important to our policymakers, inspiring students, and ensuring a brighter future for us all. So thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Dr. Clough, and I uh, figured I'd give you a little extra time there because you were doing a good job of going through uh, exactly what the uh, what you are doing is a very good explanation. Of course, the, the only thing I, I keep thinking, though, is I'm going to have nightmares of that <laughs> thing that you have sitting there in front of you as I'm sitting there, <laughs> sitting here watching you uh, listening to you give your give your testimony. Uh, but uh, Chair, and I'll recognize uh, Ms. Brown for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, it is my great pleasure to appear before the subcommittee to testify about science education at the Smithsonian Institution. I was recently named the Director of Education for the Smithsonian, and prior to this, I served for more than a decade as the Director of the Arts and Culture Program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation in New York City. Um, this is not my first tour of duty at the Smithsonian Institution. I also served as the director of the National African American Museum Project and was at one time the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Arts and Humanities. Secretary Cloth has made it clear that the Smithsonian will be focused on education. The Smithsonian has a long history of serving educators by providing extensive informal and formal education for learners of all ages. During this time in our history, when we are of necessity considering our world holistically, encyclopedic institutions like the Smithsonian are uniquely suited to help learners understand the connections between the sciences, the arts, and the humanities. 
We believe that the Smithsonian is essential in helping educators better understand and explain our complex and interconnected world. As the Director of Education, I have been tasked with the development of an institution-wide plan for educational initiatives, the implementation of assessment strategies that will measure our impact on the field, and securing support for projects that will benefit K-12 through students. In this capacity, I will also oversee the Smithsonian's education organizations, and I will coordinate the efforts of 32 education-based offices in museums and scientific institutions um, throughout the entire museum complex. Currently, many of the Smithsonian Museum's research centers and outreach offices work with educators on both a local and national level to enhance the teaching of science through the use of our collections and our research. We assist school administrators with the development of strategic plans that lead to the implementation of research-based science education programs in their districts. We provide traditional curricula and digital teaching tools so that we can enhance school-based learning. We also train teachers throughout the country who use our curricula to teach science in innovative ways. We continue to be well respected for offering timely and engaging on-site programs that give educators and students direct access to primary source materials and expose them to concrete examples of natural phenomena and scientific innovations. One of my challenges will be to unify our many education initiatives and help the Smithsonian become a greater national resource for students and teachers, especially those who will never be able to participate in on-site programming on the mall. An excellent example of the Smithsonian's ability to bring science literacy to learners of all ages is the research and programming around the National Museum of Natural History's Oceans Initiative. Based on extensive research in marine science, the museum developed a major exhibition that reaches families, individuals, and school groups. There's a publication, Oceans, Our Water, Our World, a teacher's guide and a family guide. The website, Ocean Portal, provides information that is available in the exhibition as well as current news about oceans, including stories on the Gulf oil spill and sustainable seafood. Um, I was with a group of teachers last evening who work in rural communities who had just been through that exhibition, and they were most excited about the portal that would allow them to teach lessons in their home communities. The portal also encourages members of the public to submit essays and share their opinions on a blog through videos, photographs, and polls. The Smithsonian Online Conference on Climate Change also included research on coral reefs. More than 20,000 learners of all ages have participated in, in the Smithsonian's online conferences. The Smithsonian's museums, zoo, libraries, and scientific research centers offer hands-on learning experiences that can play an important role in transforming education in our nation. The lessons that we are learning from teaching science on site are rapidly being translated into digital forms that can be broadly disseminated. We are living in a moment when the convergence of the intellectual and creative capital of the Smithsonian Institution and the opportunities made possible by the digital revolution can lead to broad and engaging points of access for learners of all ages. Technology presents us with an opportunity to reshape the future of education. It is no longer acceptable for us to share only a small percentage of our 137 million specimens and artifacts in an age when the internet and technology have made it possible to share it all. Our job is to authenticate and inform the significance of the collections, not to control access to them. In doing this, the relevance of the Smithsonian to education can be greatly enhanced as we learn from learners new applications for our scholarships. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Chair now recognize Dr. Birmingham. Thank you, Chairman Lipinski, Dr. Ellers, and Mr. Baird, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to provide testimony today. You're all invited to Stry in Panama, announced or unannounced. My name is Biff Birmingham. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, or Stry. I've been at Stry 20 years, first as a staff scientist, during which time I've published more than 140 articles and books on tropical biodiversity. For the past seven years, I've served as deputy director and now director of Stry. 
I'm responsible for 40 PhD staff and 350 technical staff. Located in the Republic of Panama, Stry is the only bureau of the Smithsonian Institution located outside the United States. We serve as custodians for the Barrow Colorado Nature Monument, which sits in the middle of the Panama Canal. The monument is the only mainland tropical forest reserve in the world under U.S. stewardship. This year we begin celebrations of 100 years of Smithsonian science on the Isthmus of Panama, a history tracing back to the 1910-1912 Smithsonian expeditions to Panama authorized by President William H. Taft to provide data on tropical biological diversity in light of the Panama Canal construction effort. Tropical diseases and their insect vectors defeated the French in their effort to construct a canal across Panama, and the Smithsonian expedition aimed to provide detailed biological understanding of tropical biodiversity to ensure U.S. success. With laboratories on both coasts of Panama, Stry is the only institute in the Americas providing direct research access to both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The recurring two-ocean theme in science education and marine science at Stry has resulted in landmark studies of the evolution and ecology of tropical marine species and communities, as well as research funded by the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health for ecologically guided discovery of novel pharmaceutical compounds. Immediate access to two oceans makes Stry a critical U.S. resource for studying the impact of climate change and ocean acidification on nearshore coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves. And given the Gulf oil spill, it's worth noting that the first ever study of the impact of an oil spill on tropical marine ecosystems was financed by the Mineral Management Services and carried out at Stry more than 20 years ago. The Stry mission is superbly well aligned to the Smithsonian Grand Challenge, understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet. This challenge requires integrating information across different biological scales and different fields of scientific inquiry. Towards this end, Stry administers the Smithsonian Institution Global Earth Observatories, or SciGeo, a global network of 40 large-scale forest plots in 21 countries. The first observatory in the network was established 30 years ago at Stry, and the forest survey methodology we developed was unprecedented in scale and scope. Over the years, the standard census methods developed at Stry to address, to address complex questions about tropical biodiversity have also proved to be a powerful approach to studying the impact of global climate change on forest ecosystems. To date, we have made more than 11 million measurements representing 8,500 tree species around the world. Given scientific uncertainty and the importance of new research regarding forest response to climate change, the network is expanding rapidly. In the United States alone, and supported by a $1.25 million increase to the Smithsonian FY10 budget, we've added new forest plots in Maryland, Virginia, Wisconsin, Washington, California, and Hawaii. More than 200 university and government scientists have published research based on results from the Smithsonian Forest Observatories. This week's cover article in Science, our nation's premier science magazine, is a recent high-profile example of the critical importance of long-term data for our understanding of forest change through time. As we look to the future, forest remediation in the developing world will take on increasing prominence as we consider food and water security and human migration associated with landscape degradation and sea level rise. Research and science education in this light is critical, a need that the Smithsonian is addressing with the Panama Canal watershed experiment. This experiment will run for at least 25 years and is designed to be a global example for understanding the relationship between land use decisions, climate change, and biological diversity. It is a powerful example given the impressive list of ecosystem services provided by the Panama Canal watershed. To name just a few, regulation of water supply to the canal in order to reduce risk of flooding and infrastructure damage while ensuring sufficient water to operate the locks. Avoided deforestation, reforestation, and carbon sequestration, which couple to represent an important research agenda for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Provision of habitat for endangered species and regulation of disease vectors. Stry has recently been awarded a $3.8 million National Science Foundation International Partnership in Research and Education Grant to study new fossils and geology exposed by the excavations of the multi-billion dollar expansion of the Panama Canal. 
This massive excavation provides researchers an unparalleled opportunity to strengthen our understanding of the role the Isthmus of Panama has played with regard to climate and biodiversity change through time and a unique perspective on how increasing carbon dioxide levels may shape the forests of the future. In closing, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the Smithsonian's commitment to long-term research and education. With our research perspective, sustained effort, and long-term data sets and educational assets, we are uniquely positioned to assess, identify, understand, and predict environmental threats to biodiversity and incorporate rigorous science into resource management and stewardship decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Birmingham. I now recognize uh, Ms. Werb. Chairman Lipinski and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on science education activities of the Smithsonian. I have been the Director of Education and Outreach at the National Museum of Natural History for about two years. Before I arrived, my knowledge and experience of the museum was that of a DC resident, a mother of two boys, and 18 years as a museum professional. I now fully appreciate that the scientific resources at the museum are an incredible treasure trove. The museum has more than 200 active scientists, hundreds of experts, including conservators, collection specialists, and educators who bring to their work research, deep knowledge, passion, and great stories. There are more than 126 million objects that represent a unique collection of evidence about the universe, the Earth, life on this planet, and human culture. With more than seven million visitors on site and tens of million more online, and as a national science museum, we have both a unique responsibility and an opportunity to further science, literacy, and public engagement around science. This especially resonated when President Obama launched the Educate to Innovate campaign for excellence in STEM education, challenging the nation to strengthen America's role as the world's engine of scientific discovery in the 21st century. The National Museum of Natural History is itself an engine of scientific discovery. Its mission is to inspire curiosity, discovery, and learning about nature and culture through research, collections, exhibitions, and education. The museum plays an important role in the Smithsonian Institution's new strategic plan, helping to meet the plan's grand challenges as referenced in the Secretary's testimony. Visitors to the museum, both on site and online, are exposed to ongoing research which enhances their critical thinking skills. Students of all ages are being invited to actively participate in science. For example, a family may visit the Sand Ocean Hall with an invertebrate zoologist examining a newly identified jellyfish species at the Scientist is In station. I have included more detailed examples of these programs in my submitted testimony, but will focus my remarks on one creative program that illustrates how the museum is bringing science to students. This program is the Youth Engagement Through Science, or YES program, which provides access to educational and career development opportunities in science to minority youth in Washington, D.C. region. This summer, we have 15 rising 10th and 11th grade students. During this six-month program, students explore natural history and pursue meaningful research projects with the museum's best scientists in the biological, geological, and anthropological disciplines. YES provides a curriculum to enhance the students' communication skills and support their college preparation activities. This component is crucial because 10th grade is the year when students need to prepare for college. YES ensures that as students experience scientific careers as viable, they are also engaged in college preparation. That planning includes improving critical reading, writing, and mathematical skills, as well as understanding the college entrance process. By the end of their YES experience, the participants will have been engaged in important research with world-class scientists, started planning for college, and produced a project based on what they have learned. Here's an excerpt from a letter one of our participants wrote to her grandparents. I started my internship at the Museum of Natural History and I absolutely love it. My assigned project is fossilized charcoal where I am going to work with 73 million-year-old objects. The museum is not only a tourist attraction, it's actually a major research facility and education center. We are not only learning the facts of the museum, but we are going to be doing research alongside scientists. These first days have been fun, and I'm excited to work with them for the next six months. I definitely want to study science. I can't wait to see what we'll be doing tomorrow. Camila. 
The museum is having a major impact in minority communities by using our tremendous science resources to train students in research at the undergraduate and high school level, providing valuable experiences that will prepare them to compete for positions. In addition to the 400 interns and fellows that the museum hosts each year, we have also launched the Natural History Research Experiences Program. These summer internships pair undergraduates with mentors on the museum's research and collection staff, providing a hands-on introduction to research. The program provides participants with a stipend, travel allotment, housing and funds for a research proposal. This summer, we are hosting 18 students. 40% of them are from underrepresented groups. These are just a few examples of how the museum is providing access to its scientific assets to engage and educate the public. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. I thank the witnesses. Our chairman will return shortly. Uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes, and uh, then we'll proceed to Dr. Ehlers. With the last name of Baird, it was mandatory that I attend a hearing uh, on the <laughs> Smithsonian, but it's also a delight. Um, a, a couple of issues I hope you'll just expand on a little bit. First of all, I was thrilled to see the opening of the Oceans exhibit. Uh, many of us on this committee have worked very hard to raise awareness and it's a spectacular exhibit. It really does a good job. I'm also very interested in, in the issue of science diplomacy and, and the international presence of the Smithsonian elsewhere, I think, uh, speaks well to that. But I wonder if you could talk about how the Smithsonian fits into to, to international efforts to educate the public about science and to fit into our, our, our mission, uh, our opportunity, rather, to, to build relationships. I've been to the Library of Alexandria, for example, and. I, I understand the origin of the meaning muse, or the word museum actually traces back to that. So anyway, oh, 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 t talk to us a little bit about what the Smithsonian is doing internationally that can help uh, build relationships internationally. Dr. Clough? Uh, I'll go first and then maybe others want to comment. We're in about 90 different countries in terms of the things and activities that we do. I mentioned some of the countries that I've visited. I haven't been to 90 countries, but uh, it's fascinating to be there. Uh, and I think it, science is really a language that is, uh, is, is a global language and helps people understand because the, the problem of the environment is something that affects every nation, not just one nation. So I think uh, that our science work is, is global to begin with. Uh, our scientists are very much known globally. I think the Smithsonian is pretty unique in that, in that, in that activity in that, for example, uh, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute would be open to scientists from other countries coming to work there and learn from us. They certainly can visit us, and many do visit the Natural History Museum to use the collections that are quite unique. And we do see technology as a way of improving that because rather than coming over at a particular time to see a particular object they might be able to see, if it's digitized, they can see it digitally. They can do their work at home and then spend a much more effective time when they come see us. Uh, we are visited uh, continuously by people who want help from us, and we do a, a, the best job we can. We've just created a program called an International Museum Studies Program to help countries uh, in, in other places. And we had a visitor from Egypt not long ago because they want to build a new science museum, and they would love to get advice from us in terms of those kinds of activities. So I think we generously give advice. We offer access to our collections. Uh, we invite their scholars to come here. Uh, and then through a multiple range of activities, then we are active in that regard. Anyone else wish to comment on that? I'd be happy to say something very quickly. At STRI, we host about 1,000 visiting scientists a year, of which about four out of every 10, uh, six out of every 10 are from the U.S., four out of 10 are international. Um, so we play a remarkable role in providing science opportunity for both researchers and students from around the world. In addition, I mentioned SciGeo, which is this global network in 21 countries. And with support from National Science F Foundation and others, we provide analytical workshops. And I think it's always important to remember that all of the world's great universities are in the developed world. And I think what we do is we provide up and coming young scientists in the developing or emerging economies the opportunity to learn from some of the best. And uh, so I'm very proud of what we've done in those that way. Phenomenal. Please, Doctor. To, to add one other uh, different note on that, uh, I just got back from Haiti last week, and we're working with the State Department and with uh, the White House on helping with recovery efforts down there. Now, our efforts there are related to art and historical documents, which are today lie in the ruins of their museums and their great buildings and their 
their universities. And so we have a team down there who are working with the Haitians to help train them in how do you recover this art and save these precious documents before they get lost. The reason it comes back to science is a lot of that has to do with material science. Mm -hmm. We're working on saving murals. You've got to have the material scientists there who understand how these things adhere to the surface. If you're going to maintain the integrity of some of the frames and some of the documents, again, it's a scientific matter. And so the Smithsonian brings that to the table. So that's another example of cultural diplomacy through science. Those are all great examples. Uh, very last and briefly, talk to us very briefly about the funding for the research from uh, the research aspect of Smithsonian, and then briefly, if you care to allude to a doctor, the uh, my understanding is Smithsonian had a fairly significant uh, infrastructure backlog. Uh, I don't know if that the status of that. Maybe briefly address both of those. Sure. Well, the Smithsonian is a trust, uh, as was alluded to, I think earlier. And about 65% of our funding comes from federal appropriations. The rest of it we, quote, earn ourselves, some of which we actually compete for grants from federal agencies where that is allowed. Uh, we do a lot of work with NASA. Uh, we operate the Chandra X-ray uh, uh, satellite telescope, and so we are reimbursed from NASA uh, for that service. We also build telescopes for NASA and others, and so we are in that business as well. Uh, so there, the competitive grants. Then we also compete on, we get phil philanthropic grants for a lot of the science that we do. Uh, Dr. Birmingham just came back from England where uh, the HSBC, the banking corporation, has provided almost $10 million to do documentation with the SIGO effort. So we try to be entrepreneurial and get the funding where it makes sense to get the funding to do the work that we do. Uh, and so you'll find that to, to be, uh, but, but there's always a challenge, as, as uh, Congressman Ehlers alluded, there's really not enough money to do the work we need to do, given the opportunities that we have. And so there's a constant struggle. In addition, it's, it's very important, and I think Congress has been, particularly lately, more aware of the importance of maintaining collections. It, that's not, if you want to use the word sexy research, but it's very necessary and very important. And so it, it, w that's a sustaining kind of support we need to get from Congress. You really can't get a donor to support those kinds of activities. Now, you mentioned the business of the infrastructure issues that we face. Like any great institution with lots of buildings, we have 770 all told uh, around in our different operations. We do have some challenges in terms of maintenance. And I do like to make the point that the Smithsonian Museums are open every day of the year but Christmas. Uh, we have upwards of 30 million people going through our buildings. Uh, so that's a tremendous load on those buildings, a tremendous wear and tear on those buildings. And that's where Congress, I think, really has to help us in that public service effort that we, we have. Uh, we roughly need our calculation suggestion. You could use industrial standards and things of that sort, guidelines. About $150 million a year based on our the cost of our infrastructure uh, to revitalize the museums and then secondarily about a hundred million dollars a year to upkeep and do maintenance. So that's about 250 million a year annually. We are running probably around 180 in that total. Congress has been generous again. Uh, 180 is not 250 and so there's always a little fallback but we're working very hard to try to stay on top of the most critical maintenance and revitalization issues that we have and we try to use your funds as leverage so we work with donors in many cases to raise funds over and above what the federal government would give us to supplement those activities so we can make major renovations. Thank you very much. Recognize Dr. Ehlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the uh, buzzing I assume means we have a vote coming up very soon, so I'll try to be fairly brief. Uh, the Smithsonian is an absolutely wonderful institution. There's just no question about it. Nothing like it in the world, especially given its history, of its origin out of anger against another nation and uh, its success in, in everything it's done. At the same time, I probably worry more about the Smithsonian than I do most federal institutions. Uh, because you are quite different and your funding pattern is quite different. And it seems to me that one of your big problems is, of course, f fundraising. Uh, you're one of the few federal institutions that has to go out and raise a very substantial part of its budget. Uh, that's, um, that, that is an opportunity, but it's also a burden on you, especially uh, Dr. Clough, but, it, but also on the whole staff. They're all aware of it. 
I, I think that another problem is that uh, you are uh, first and foremost an education and research in organization. And yet, I don't believe you are treated that way very well in, in the budgetary process. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you're looked at more as a museum for the public, I think. Um, and, and rightfully so, because you do that very well and you have huge attendance figures. But even so, um, I, I, NASA has set an example, I think, for government agencies in how to reach out to the schools. They, of course, have more money to do that than you do. Uh, but I think that, that sets a good pattern that you should try to emulate if you can only extract the same amount of money from the from the Congress and perhaps from donors uh, that NASA does. Uh, so I, I'm rambling here a bit, but maybe it's because I feel so strongly about the Smithsonian and I've been involved with you, not recently, but uh, prior to that, uh, to a great extent. And I really think we, uh, it's not just your problem to solve. I think the Congress has to address this in, in a more direct fashion. And I would like to see you out in the, in the elementary and secondary schools as much as NASA is, but you can't possibly do it without appropriate funding. And so there, there's so much to be done and so little money to do it at this point. I think there really has to be a, a, a strong awakening, perhaps even a reawakening, among both the public and the Congress about the Smithsonian, what it does, what it can do, what it could do with more money, and so forth. Uh, I suspect you don't disagree with me on that, but uh, I, I guess w what I'm really trying to do is lead up to the fact that I think you need a workforce uh, of some sort, a task force to examine those issues, but there has to be uh, something happening at the Congress the congressional rebel level as well, and uh, working with you. And I, I don't see a framework for that. That's, that's what frustrated me with the House Administration Committee, which really had very little to do with the Smithsonian, uh, but yet we got called in constantly to solve problems, uh, which we didn't create, and uh, which we were, in many cases, not suitably uh, able to solve given the resources and the assignment we have. So I, I would think it would be beneficial to try to really re-examine the role the Smithsonian plays in science in this nation and uh, also you know, in terms of education and helping all the museums across the country, many of which are in also in dire fiscal straits. So I've, I've rambled on a bit, but I'd appreciate your reaction to that. Sure, and, and my colleagues again may want to join in. I think uh, you hit the nail right on the head, and one of the problems that I do get frustrated about when people think of us as a museum. Now, it's lovely that we have these fabulous museums, but people don't understand what it makes to make them work and tick, and that they are educational institutions, they are research institutions, and they have a a hundred new exhibits every year. You don't do that without a tremendous amount of effort and work uh, for uh, directed towards education. To me, I think the breakthrough for us really is the digital revolution and the fact that we can now take collections that are largely unseen. We can take researchers who are fabulous people that, uh, I mean, Biff probably represents that type of person on this panel more than anyone else, but I love to be with uh, Terry Irwin who knows more about beetles than anybody in the world. He's a fascinating uh, person. And we have dozens of people uh, who just are really remarkable scientists. And with web technology, we can get these folks out. And as we get penetrate into the schools, there will be a lot more visibility of the Smithsonian and what we actually do and what we actually stand for. Uh, we had a conference with Secretary Duncan this morning on rural education and our online programs that uh, Claudine has referred to have penetrated into the rural sector. I grew up in a rural community and I've made sure that our educational programs get to Douglas, Georgia, whenever we do that. 
And the fact of the matter is they're, more, they're so profoundly meaningful there because those communities don't have the great cultural assets of the big uh, cities. And they value what we bring to them. And right now, they don't know we exist. And the more we can get out there, we can reach people where they live, work, and play, and have a more profound impact on young people, the better off we will be. But we are working very much on this line to get the Smithsonian's science and education known out there by folks. So they will understand us better. Clearly, additional funding would be a tremendous help to us. And then take advantage of the opportunities we have to serve the American people in a much more profound way. If I may just add one note to that, uh, and perhaps I should have been more diligent in educating my colleagues about doing this, but we speak in schools a lot, and whenever I speak in a, a school, particularly elementary school, I tell the children, now when you go home tonight, you talk to your dad and mom and tell them that you want to go to Washington, D.C., and you don't just want to see flags and monuments and parades, but that you want to go to the Smithsonian Museums. And you tell them that they will never find a better deal for a vacation because everything is free. And it's a lot, lot cheaper than, than uh, Disneyland, even when you take into account the excessive lodging cost here. Uh, but I, I really give them the sales pitch, and I said, now, now you go home and tell your parents you want to go to Washington, you know, the whole family go, and you want to visit the Smithsonian, and it's not going to cost them a cent except for a place to stay, and you're willing to camp. So, <laughs> so uh, at any rate, I, I think you really need a sales pitch like that to get more of the young people interested. Thank you. Th back. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ehlers. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Bilber, are you going to have questions? Okay, let me go. Let me just make just a short statement because I'm going to be coming back and need to touch base. I'm okay, because I want to wrap this up and we there's six minutes left in the vote. Okay, um, just very short. I, I will recognize. The I, I appreciate that. Um, I just have to say to um, Dr. Biff, I, sorry I missed you um, in Panama. Um, and let me just say, Mr. Chairman, I think that, um, no offense to the other members, but one of the things that uh, I might, uh, the, um, Opportunities that Smithsonian um, uh, provides is is very diverse. Uh, the research facility in Panama shows you uh, just exactly how diverse. I really would love to get um, Vernon uh, and um, Dana Robacher over to the Smithsonian in Panama um, because I think that's the the, the way that research facilities. Um, go, working out some ideas, it, there's something for everybody and enough to raise everyone to be not so sure of their conclusions today. I think that's one of the fresh things about um, research is that you've got to be brave enough to really do proper, um, I mean, to, to be brave enough to do it right, you've got to be brave enough to question assumptions and be willing to chance being proven wrong. And that's one thing this town doesn't ever like to do. So um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, talk about tapping into that. And um, Biff, just tell, uh, I, I hope that I can take Mr. Herzog out and teach him surfing because he obviously does not understand intercoastal tides appropriately yet. Um, and a little more time in the salt water might be better than him sitting in those lakes over there, okay? I'd be delighted to. It would be a, it would be a true honor. And I agree with what you say. I think, I think what's really setting stride, but all of the Smithsonian science apart from others right now is the long-term attitude we take, and we serve as honest brokers for data. I mean, we're there to collect high-quality data over the long term um, and not to polit politicize it. Um, I'd just like to also say that I think that in terms of funding, I mean, we need the funding. There's no question about it. But uh, Dr. Clough referenced the HSBC Association we have. And I think what we're going to find, and I think one of the reasons that we were successful in getting additional funding from HSBC was the, was the strong support that we get from the federal government, recognizing that what they give us in addition to that yeah. will be carried on because of the federal investment. But at the same time, I think you're going to find corporate America, but also beyond our borders, more and more interested in investing in the type of science that the Smithsonian does because they recognize that to predict the future, they need that type of science. But I'm looking forward to getting you back to Panama. Well, and, and I, Doctor, uh, if it's possible before you leave, I'd like to be able to discuss something with you in a secure environment that is time sensitive, that specifically affects uh, your 
opportunities of expansion in the Panama uh, region. So we need to talk about that um, whenever you get a chance. My office is on this floor. I've got to go vote, but I'll be available as soon as possible, if possible, okay? I'll be there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bilbray. And uh, Chair will recognize himself for five minutes, although I don't think we'll have five minutes. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, uh, Dr. Ehler's uh, comments about, about education and uh, thank him for, uh, I completely agree about uh, members going out and, and promoting the, the Smithsonian. What I want to ask is, uh, Dr. Clough, you were a uh, president of university at Georgia Tech. How does, as a former uh, assistant professor, I wanted to ask you, how do the, um, what's the comparison between researchers at Smithsonian and those at a, uh, you know, in academe? Uh, how are, how do people get their positions? Uh, how do things work differently? Uh, we have, you know, tenure in, uh, it, uh, in academe. Uh, so can you just give me a, a comparison? There, there are many similarities, of course, because both types of individuals love research. They're passionate about what they do. Both are interested in translating their research into education. So that's the similarity. The difference is, comes back to this long-term issue. The Smithsonian it tends to be in things for the long haul. Uh, universities tend to be driven by grant cycles. Uh, they, they will work on a series of issues for a while while there's grant money, and if the grant money moves over here, they move over here. And so universities tend not to be as long-term focused as the Smithsonian would be. STRI has been in the business for 100 years. Uh, we are fortunate, for example, in some of the climate change work we've done with fossils that we've done for probably 30 years. Uh, and you wouldn't see that at a university. We also do collections-based research. Universities can't afford to have collections anymore. And so the Smithsonian has this marvelous set of collections which even today are being used with new techniques of DNA studies to discover new species without leaving Washington, D.C., but simply going to our collections uh, center and finding new species vir by virtue of DNA research. I think there's a strong component of service-based research at the Smithsonian. When the Hudson River incident occurred and the plane went down and the remains of the birds were brought down here, we were the ones who identified who, what those birds were, what the sex of the birds were, and where they came from. And we were able to point out they were Canada geese, of course. They were from Canada because uh, we knew where they had been feeding based on the analysis of the feathers and the remains. And so that gave the folks in New York a good handle on how to begin to deal with the bird issues around airports. So there's a lot of service-based focus at the Smithsonian. You don't see quite as much of that uh, at a university. The universities, of course, teach, and therefore they have direct impact on large numbers of students. Uh, the Smithsonian has a large number of interns, but ours are more short-term internship and connections uh, there. And I do think in the future we'll find uh, the Smithsonian particularly able to deliver its research to the K through 12 uh, co uh, community in a more effective way than universities can. And what do you do in terms of uh, fellowships? We have our own fellowship sources, so we have funding from, uh, even though James Smithson's money's long gone, uh, we do have an, an endowment of almost a billion dollars, and much of that has been given, like at the universities, for specific purposes. And so, for example, recently, Mr. Peter Buck, who is on the National History uh, Museum's board, uh, who is himself a physicist, uh, gave $20 million to the Smithsonian for fellowships and a wonderful gift. So it allows young people from universities uh, and other entities to come to the Smithsonian and study with us in the sense of a graduate student, if you will, or a postdoc uh, here at the Smithsonian. Now, in addition, we have another pool of funds we use for interns, and that would be for young undergraduates who come to the Smithsonian and study here. Some universities, Smith being one, has its own endowment from an alumnus for 13 of their students to come here and spend a year at the Smithsonian each, uh, each year. And so we're trying to build those relationships. We're signing MOUs with universities. Uh, we're working with universities so we have more direct connections with them in terms of our research. Uh, and that's something I've been able to use my former experience uh, to good effect with. Uh, for example, George Mason, now we offer a joint degree in conservation biology, which has been, now they'll have the education, they have the admissions department and all the degree granting ability, but we share responsibility for the degree, the student study at the zoo and in Front Royal. Uh, there. So we have facilities they don't have. We can use that to help educate students in a different way than they can. I, do, I have um, 
a bill to in try to increase the um, uh, collaboration between museums and uh, national labs. Is there any collaboration with Smithsonian National Labs, if you can answer that in 30 seconds or less? Mm -hmm. We do have uh, connections with National Labs, particularly you know, with the different agencies, typically through the agencies more than the, the National Labs. A lot of the National Labs are energy related, and we don't do energy research per se. Now, we do research that forms energy and forms through, for example, climate change. We've had discussions with Dr. Chu uh, and, and uh, with a number of the people out in Biff. I know you re met recently with the Department of Energy because they're looking for ways to begin to quantify the beneficial effects of carbon sequestration. We can do that when we work with them, and we're working with the Department of Energy and uh, with the Arizona State University because we don't have an economics department, and they do have one that focuses on that activity. So we're looking to partner with, with groups where we have something in common and we can, we can have good values. We're working with Battelle uh, on education, and I know Claudine's been talking to them as well. Uh, they're very interested in inner city education, as we are, uh, and so we are going to be working with Battelle on delivery, particularly in the D.C. school systems, I think, fairly soon about that. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Claudine. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd love to hear about it, but unfortunately we are uh, out of time to vote on the floor. Uh, we still have some good number of members out. We'll be able to make it there, but I'm going to need to... Uh, to bring this hearing to, to a close. I, I want to, before that, I want to thank all of our witnesses for testifying. Uh, the record is going to remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. And uh, again, I want to thank the witnesses for their, their testimony today and their work uh, with the Smithsonian. And with that, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>